Good morning. Welcome back. This is Kylie Becker, the communication instructor at Eastern Arizona College. I have my coffee ready and we're going to go ahead and get started talking about chapter 16, which is persuasive speaking. So you guys come across persuasion everywhere. All of the billboards, TV commercials, all the YouTube ads that seem to just keep getting more and more prevalent. Like I swear I have like six ads before they let me watch you know, a single video, ads on Pandora, uh, uh, the Super Bowl, Super Bowl ads, that's what I was thinking of, that big football sport. Um, if someone at McDonald's tries to sell you a supersized meal, if someone tries to get you to buy that insurance for your phone, if there's an organization trying to get you to join them, if someone's trying to convince you to vote for a specific person or take a specific action, those are all persuasion. So something we have to ask ourselves is, would these companies and would these people spend the time and the money to come up with these uh, campaigns if they didn't actually work? And the answer is no. Budweiser is not going to spend $15 million on a 30-second Super Bowl ad unless it sells them more Budweiser. Uh, Nike is not going to spend $500,000 on just a regular TV commercial with, I don't know, who does, who does Nike's? Is, is that Michael Jordan? I don't know. I, I am not a sports person, so I don't know why I always use sports examples because I honestly know nothing about sports. But, you know, Nike would not pay $500,000 for a celebrity appearance to wear their shoes and talk about Nikes unless it sold more Nikes. So, what is persuasion? It's basically, in its simplest terms, the art of convincing other people to give favorable attention, so positive attention, to your point of view. And when we are doing our persuasive speeches in particular, we are trying to influence beliefs, attitudes, values, or actions. And sorry if you guys can hear some background noise, the cats are sprinting around and jumping on things. So this is not to say that we are trying to get someone to change a core belief about their person, uh, but a more peripheral belief. Because in this class, you're not going to convince anyone to change religions or to change political parties or something else that is very much a core belief of their person. So typically, it's not even worth it to bother trying to do that because it's not going to work if you're specifically out to change their mind on something like that. So we're trying to establish agreement on a particular topic or we are seeking to motivate particular behaviors. So you either want someone to, you know, agree with you and be like, oh yeah, that's right. I can see your point in there. I, I can understand and then maybe take action on it. Um, or you are specifically trying to get people to take action. Maybe if they already kind of agree with you. So if you're canvassing for a political candidate and, you know, you go knock on someone's door and you're talking with them, let's say they already agree with you that they think your political candidate is, you know, a good person. They want to vote for them. So you don't have to try to convince them to vote for that person. You're just convincing them to go out and vote and saying, hey, um, what are some things that would maybe prevent you from voting and what can you do? So, you know, come election day or come the time you get your mail-in ballot, how are you going to you know, go about it? Do you have a way to get there? Do you make sure that you always have pins in the same drawer so that you can you know, put down your checkbox and sign your name and date it and send it off? Um, and then get that verbal agreement of them actually to do it because if people, people tend to want to do the things they say they're going to do. So if you can get a verbal agreement and they say, yes, you know, when I get my mail-in ballot come, October, November, whatever, I will vote, or I will do X, Y, Z. When we're specifically talking about persuasive speeches and giving them in, to an audience in particular, there are three main types. You have questions of fact, questions of policy, and questions of value. So questions of fact simply ask, can it be proven? 
based on data and interpretation of evidence, does something exist? Is this thing true? And you can even say what will happen in the future to an extent, obviously. I don't think any of us are, uh, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm not wording well this morning. People who can see into the future, none of us are raven from that so raven, I assume. So a question effect might be like, does Bigfoot exist? Can you find data and evidence to support that? Um, one of the questions of fact could be a, a huge California earthquake. Based on data and evidence, California will probably have a very large earthquake in the future, in the close future or in the far future, you know, to be determined. You know, none of us can look in and see and say, hey, in five years, California is going to fall off into the ocean. But based on evidence, you could say it is extremely likely that this will happen. You know, based on evidence, it is extremely likely that, you know, giant squids, you know, live in the ocean or based on evidence, it's extremely likely or extremely unlikely that Bigfoot or Megalodon or insert whatever here does or does not exist. You have questions of policy. So what is the appropriate course of action? Is there something we should start doing or stop doing? Can a rule or a law be changed to make things better? So a question of policy would be like helmets in football. So back in the day, when you're playing football, you know, the helmets weren't that great, right? Or you may not have even been required to wear one. However, a policy change happened where they said, you know, we're tired of all these traumatic brain injuries. It's hurting these kids. We should have a policy that says you must wear a protective helmet while you are playing football. Or a policy might be banning single-use plastic bags. There are some cities that have done that, and that is a question of policy. So would that actually make things better? Would it be effective? So for questions of policy, you look at the status quo, then you identify the problem and have to explain why it's significant. So why are traumatic brain injuries for these football players significant? Well, obviously it's a traumatic brain injury. Why are single use plastic bags an issue? Well, because they totally trash up that um, over there by the Safford High School and makes it look really bad whenever the wind blows or because they're bad for the environment or insert whatever reason here about why it's significant. And then you offer your proposal. So their proposal is to require helmets or the proposal is to ban single use plastic bags and implement a reusable bag system and why it will help. Well, it will decrease traumatic brain injuries. It will decrease the level of pollution over there by the Safford High School and make it look prettier so people want to come into to Safford and hang out. I don't know. And then you have questions of value. So what is the relative worth of something? You have to have criteria to evaluate this claim by. Um, but it can look at morality. So a question of value could be death penalty, but that could also be a question of policy or a question of fact too, depending on how you phrase it. Um, what is the wisdom of an action? What is more aesthetic than something else? What is more desirable? And comparison. So if you wanted to look at zoos versus animal sanctuaries, that is a question of value. Uh, if you wanted to see, you know, if cats or dogs or ferrets are the better pet, that is a question of value, but you need criteria to evaluate it by. So for me, who has three cats, I might say, well, cats are the better pet, but someone who has three dogs might say, well, dogs are, but what are we evaluating it by? So if we say, you know, we want a pet that will go on hikes with us, that will offer some personal protection if someone wants to break into our house, that are always down for love and cuddles and, you know, just want to be around you, you know, that unconditional love thing, then the better pet would probably be a dog. If you value more of something with independence that you can leave alone for a weekend with enough food and water and not be too worried, um, that will let you love and cuddle it occasionally, but doesn't need to be around you all the time, then maybe you want a cat. So you just have to have criteria to evaluate said 
claim by. So when we're dealing with persuasion, we really do have to consider our audience. Um, I think in chapter five, I talked about how your audience is probably your most important consideration. So do you know their opinion on your topic? And you can have three types of audiences mainly. You can have neutral audiences who are pretty neutral. They don't really care. Um, you can have receptive audiences who already agree with you and you're very positive about your topic or you and then you have hostile audiences who either disagree with you as a person, as a human being, because maybe they just don't like you, or they are hostile towards the particular topic that you are presenting. So once again, hostile, they may take an issue with your topic or just you as a speaker. Um, you know, people make snap judgments of others on first impressions. And sometimes they just take issue with you as a person. So then your first and, you know, pretty much only goal at that moment is to get them to actually listen to you. So how you do this is you highlight issues on which you both agree. So you have to establish common ground with them. And then you'll offer your proposition as a way to get to that particular shared goal that you identified with them in the beginning. But you do have to acknowledge the reservations of the other party. So, you know, I know the people here have reservations about blank. However, we are all here, you know, we can all agree on, you know, protecting children or saving lives, or insert whatever here. You know, we just have a different way of going about it. I understand your point, you know, but please, you know, here is my suggestion for it too. Um, the majority of your audiences are going to be neutral audiences. They're not really passionate about you as a person or the particular topic, but sometimes they might just be unaware of how something affects them. And this is most of the people that you're going to be dealing with. So first step is gain their attention. Uh, like we talked about in intros and conclusions, no one really cares what you have to say until you get their attention and let them know why it affects them. So gain attention, offer a way it directly affects them, and then offer resources for more information. So I Short story time. So I had a student who gave a really good speech about sex trafficking. Obviously, most of our audience is going to be pretty neutral towards that in, you know, in a Thatcher, Eastern Arizona classroom, because I, I really hope no one in there has personal experience with that or would be hostile to learning about it. Um, so, you know, she gained their attention because we are very close to a major highway. It does or it can affect them because we have a lot of people coming and going through the area. But then she also had a lot of ways that the students in the class could directly help, like maybe not directly help the people involved because, you know, who's, you know, 100% accurate at identifying sex trafficking victims, but resources for if you think someone might be um, like, she told everyone about an app on your phone where you can take pictures of hotel rooms and, you know, through the app, it'll upload it to a police database. So if they see pictures of people who are being sold online at hotels, they can match up to what particular hotel that that person might be in, in that area and so on and so forth. So she did a really good job about getting their attention by kind of, you know, a not very happy topic offering a way that it directly affects them because we are very close to major highways um, and a lot of crossroads. So it could be something they see, but don't even know that they're seeing. And then she had a lot of resources that offered more information and even ways that these particular students could go about um, helping directly or indirectly. And then your receptive audience, which is also, it's like a hostile audience, it's pretty rare. Um, but you're receptive, they already know something about your topic, and they're generally open to it or supportive of it. 
So for this one, it's really easy. You just have to foster a little bit more of that identification or that similarity. And then, you know, what you're here for, like I'm here to convince you guys to go out and vote in the election. Um, so I'd like to ask, you know, are you going to go vote? What steps are you going to go take to go vote to make sure that you get out there and support our candidate, blah, 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 blah. So there's different strategies to try to convince people of something. And most of the time you don't just stick with one, you use a mixture of all of them. And ethos, pathos, and logos, you will hear me pronounce it probably six different ways in the time that I talk about this because I'm just that type of person. Uh, but ethos is an argument based on character or authority, you know, kind of credibility. So like when Nike or all these makeup ads use someone famous, they are using ethos based on character. You like that actor, you wanna look like them. You want to buy that product. Someone in a uniform. If nine out of 10 dentists prefer credit, or if nine out of dentists prefer Crest or whatever, that could partially be an argument based on character or authority. You could maybe kind of see it as a little bit of logos if they're using like real data and statistics, but who knows, you know, they, do, they don't say if those nine out of 10 dentists were paid by Crest to say that, right? Um, and also just professional looking people. So when you stand up in front of a room or at a work presentation and you look professional, you immediately gain a little bit of credibility just based on how you look. Hence why no sweatpants when you are giving speeches in class, because you want to immediately um, get that authority-based credibility. Um, you have pathos, an argument based on emotion, so trying to cause fear, desire, sympathy, anger, a scarcity. So, you know, this sale won't last. There's only, you know, two of these left. left. Hurry down and get them before it's gone. You know, in the arms of the angel commercial for the ASPCA, we're all the sad puppies, and don't lie, we all cry. Or we all get some, like, tear pricks behind our eyes. Um, fear, get this or else, or you'll be a failure, or something bad will happen. You know, your family won't be safe, blah, blah, blah. Desire. All those, you know, pretty women eating those big cheeseburgers, um, beer using attractive women in swimwear to, you know, sell it, um, empathy, sad kids. <laughs> you can even use pathos for hunger. So awesome looking food that looks way better than it does in real life. You know, we see that McDonald's commercial and you're like, man, that Big Mac looks kind of good. And you get there and you're like, this Big Mac looks really sad. Um, and then logos is argument based on logic, facts, and figures. Obviously, logos, something based on truth, is a little bit more trustworthy than the other two. But we also consciously and subconsciously are persuaded by the others as well. So you'll know it's logos when you see facts, percentages, actual true information, charts and figures, data backed up by peer review, all that jazz. Um, so here's just another graphic for it. So Logos will have arguments, um, benefits, facts, figures, data, statistics, scientific research, all that jazz. It's the numbers thing, though it's not always number. It can literally be like word descriptions as well. Um, but you don't get logos from your delivery. You just get logos from your content. But you can get ethos and pathos from your delivery as well. So you can get ethos or authority and credibility from having good eye contact, having good body language, varying your vocals and being poised. You can get pathos or that emotional uh, appeal in your delivery by having coherence between your body language, your voice, with the specific content. So if I'm talking about how to hire a clown or a bouncy house for a birthday and trying to persuade you to do that through my company, I'm not probably going to be, I guess you guys can't see me right now, 
um, but I'm not going to probably be all somber and monotone trying to convince you to, you know, hire these fun things for small children. But if I'm talking about, you know, the opiate death rate for teenagers in the state of Arizona, I'm probably not going to be all super happy and chipper about it because that's not, that's not appropriate. So you need to have coherence. So your body language must match the tone of the topic you're talking about. Because if you're happy about all these sad puppies, people get really thrown off, you know? Um, and then through content, ethos, personal anecdotes, testimonials, track records, stories, all that jazz, and then pathos, you know, sad stories, and then cultivating positive and or negative emotions. You know, you can do both. Um, so uh, we talked briefly about logical fallacies uh, when we talked about chapter six. I think we've talked about chapter six already. Yeah, this is persuasion. We're past all that. Um, so just kind of a recap, you can go check those out. Um, do not be using logical fallacies when we're doing persuasion. Like people do it in real life all the time. Um, because a lot of people who aren't critical thinkers fall for logical fallacies. So it's something that you need to look out for as someone who is having persuasion thrown at them. And then when you are persuading, you need to make sure that you are being an ethical communicator and not using logical fallacies and manipulating people through that. So there are four ways to organize the persuasive messages that we have talked about. Um, I think this is the last thing that we'll talk about before we end. You have Monroe's motivated sequence, you have the direct, causal, and refutation. So remember, we have our three types, our questions of fact, our questions of policy, and our questions of value, and then we can organize those in these four ways. So Monroe's motivated sequence. So obviously get their attention. First things first, get their attention because they don't care until you have until you have their attention. And then you identify the need um, of your audience or you show them that there is a problem. You show them what the solution is and why it will work. So here is your problem or here is your need. We can solve this by doing this thing. Here is the solution. And then help them visualize the solution. So as we implement this, you know, imagine what your life will be like, you know, if you buy this little vacuum robot thing, no more hours, you know, per week wasted pushing the vacuum around the house, no more frightening your pets with the loud vacuum cleaner. You just have to set this little guy down, poke the button, and he will find his way around your house. You'll get those cute videos of kittens, your, or I guess your pets, sitting on top of this little vacuum guy, and all will be well. So act now and purchase our little Roomba. I finally remember what the name was that. It's a Roomba. Um, so get their attention, identify the need, show them how you and your product or whatever can solve this issue or satisfy their need. Have them visualize the benefits of doing this action will be, and then close with a call to action to get them to actually do it. So go out and purchase this thing or go out and vote or write to your senators or insert whatever here, go out and adopt a dog. And then our last three methods, direct. So if your audience is neutral or just very mildly for or against you, easiest way is just make the claim and then list your reasons to support it. So Bigfoot is real. Reason to support. People have reported seeing Bigfoot in the Americas for the past 1700 years. Uh, there has been video evidence captured, well, you know, for the past 40 years or whatever by da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Insert citation here. 
um, your causal, so some cause and then its effects. So you have to convince us of the relationship uh, between it. So your claim or your cause, um, Max, so Apple computers have good user interface and encourage people to quote unquote think different. The effect, users spend less time figuring out how to work it. They put out more high quality product and therefore Mac users are more creative. And then refutation. So if your audience is already against you, uh, we've already kind of talked about this before, you know, signal argument that you are addressing. So addressing some points on which you may agree on as well. So show them the places where you agree with them because if you have no plates of places of agreement, it might not be worth talking to them. Um, people who are very dogmatic, people who are zealots, it's probably not worth getting into that argument. Just we tend to just let those people be. Uh, so address points on which you agree, state your own arguments, provide evidence and justification for your side. You know, I know your side says this, however, you know, my side says this. Actually, you shouldn't even use the word however or but when you're in, you know, a persuasive argument, quote, unquote. Use and. So your side says this. Okay, and what about this thing that my side says? Because then you're not, it seems like you're less, quote unquote, attacky and less defensive. And then summarize the response. Okay, so we are done with that. If we have, or I guess if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to shoot me an email or a Canvas message. Um, I think I might have went over this a little fast and if I did I apologize like I said you are welcome to shoot me an email with any questions or if something was unclear um, please feel free I look forward to hearing from you guys and hope to see y'all soon